Hello friends. In today's video, I don't talk about one specific concept. This is going to be a problem solving video. And that problem is not having motivation for anything. A lot of people tend to be in this state where, yeah, there's nothing really wrong with my life right now. And while I acknowledge that my life could be better, I don't see a point in it. And this problem particularly resonates with me because I was basically like this. Rewind time back to around like last April. Um, my sister suggested I study to be a life coach. And at the time, I was a software engineer and I was just getting coached as a client. I wasn't like, I wasn't even thinking about coaching other people. So everything was pretty comfy, right? Nothing really wrong with my life, and I I have been um, I had been getting coached for over a year. So a lot of my mental problems um, were no longer there. I resolved a lot of um, past experiences that I interpreted as bad. I resolved a lot of internal conflict about things I felt icky about. So yeah. Everything was pretty smooth sailing, all good. So when I got the offer, when I got the invitation from my sister, I was like, eh, I could, but like, I don't really see the point in doing that. And then now I'm getting the training. And then as I'm getting the training, like everybody else in the group is like, oh yeah, I'm gonna start coaching other people and I'm gonna have a coaching business. And I was like, eh. Do I really want to do that? Not really, because you know I already have a pretty nice paying job and you know life is pretty comfy. No need to really like do that. So what was the one conclusive um, answer or the thought that changed my mind? It was when it was pointed out that if you are feeling comfy and you don't want anything better, then the, it's just that you don't love yourself that much. And that was really kind of a whoa moment for me. All right, so let's break that down a little bit. So what does this have to do with self-love? Self-love is loving yourself unconditionally without, you know, like, oh, yeah, I make some mistakes and I occasionally stutter and, you know, I don't look like a model and I'm not like super tall, but I accept myself for who I am and regardless of like my other qualities, I choose to love myself. So that's like the baseline uh, understanding of self-love that I have. But when you really love someone like somebody else, for example, I love my wife very much, then you have the willingness and the desire to really provide for that other person, right? Like even though it means inconvenient, it, and even if it means inconveniencing you sometimes, right? So yeah, if I want to give my wife flowers for our anniversary, it does inconvenience me to go out of my way, like break out of my routine, drive to a flower shop and order, and then like pick them up all without her realizing, you know, like the surprise. So. Those are things that I do like painstakingly, but at the same time very willingly because I have a lot of love for the person who's going to receive it and I want them to be happy. All the things that would come from a kind of a better life for yourself, for example, a better apartment or a better house or better clothes, better cars and all these like material things. And it doesn't have to be like material things too, right? Like maybe having children, maybe adopting a new pet, or um, you know, getting a promotion or getting an even better job. All of these things are things that you would want to offer to another significant other person. And if you're having trouble doing that for yourself, then underlying all of that, underlying that like refusal is your belief that you don't deserve there's a belief that says you, why do you need that you shouldn't have that and basically that's when you start realizing that love is conditional now we have a base understanding of where this um, problem originates from I have no motivation to get better because like you know everything is good now so why do more yeah number one 
it's because you have no really willingness to provide something even better for yourself. That's underneath the base of all reasons. And now, the second prominent reason why you don't want nice things for yourself is because you are likely to have had negative experiences out of desires. And so for example, if you really wanted a promotion and you had to compete with somebody and then you fought like tooth and nails but then you didn't get the promotion, then that leaves a lot of scars, right? And it doesn't have to be about work promotions. Like maybe you wanted a really like nice toy, fancy toy that's in the you know toy stores, but your mom didn't give it to you and that was like, whoa, big disappointment. So a lot of it is like, the more I wanted something and I didn't get it, the more hurtful it was, the more painful it was. And so we get into this like pre-traumatizing for ourselves, right? Because a lot of how our brain processes trauma is to just shove it in and like just ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. And so effectively, when you're not, when you're willingly not expecting things because of the fear of disappointment, it's kind of you're like you're pretty traumatizing yourself. It's very understandable that your brain would do that because your primitive brain, of, uh, other than anything, wants safety and comfort. And you know, like feeling bad about things, especially feeling disappointment about something that you really wanted. So like. The expectation was here, but the reality was here. So when this like drop is significantly high, it's gonna impact you emotionally in a very significant kind of a uh, magnitude, right? To work around that is, again, we tie it back to self-love. And that's why self-love is at the baseline of everything. Because, you know, yeah. What if that dis like that disappointment doesn't have to control your life but when you let the fear of disappointment stop you from doing things then you that disappointment is like the puppet master and you're just a puppet and what do we learn from life coaching that you are in control of your life you can decide what to do with your life and how you want to take yourself into that direction and by now you should be realizing that disappointment is one of the really significant blockers in you doing that. And so, why let a single emotion like disappointment rule the rest of your life? So in the grand scheme of things, when you stop letting disappointment take control over your life, you can start taking little actions, right? So maybe you wanna go to grad school, but you didn't want to take the, um, you, you, you were dreading the GREs and you didn't want to study for that because you know like what if you get a get bad grade this is a dilemma a lot of like pre-grad school people have but if you are willing to take a potential disappointment if you are willing to take that little bit of discomfort as a price for what's really valuable to you then it, it actually sounds like a pretty fair exchange uh, for another example, I know that interviews is very stressful for a lot of people. Interviews are really bad for me too. I would always get really nervous and I would just like freeze in front of the computer screen, especially when I'm doing online coding interviews and such. But you know, if you can get that job after you do this, then the interview is kind of like a price to pay. It becomes an even exchange, but it becomes an even exchange only if and only if that job is really worth it for you. So now we get to, you know, now you have to assess. So what do you really want? What, what sounds really good to you? So like a million dollars sounds really nice, but is that what you really want? Like does money really make you happy aside from society telling you that money makes people happy? If it is, then the labor and the effort in order for you to make a million dollars it's going to be worth it because in the end, that million dollars you wanted ends up in your bank balance, right? And for, um, for me, being in touch with my childhood and connecting with my childhood dreams is very important to me. I briefly grew up in the city of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. And I remember just playing in the backyard where there was just like a grass field everywhere. 
and there was like a sprinkler and the water. It was a hot summer day and I was just having the time of my life in that big grass yard. And so one of the really like big life goals that I have for myself is to kind of relive that experience by eventually purchasing a home with a really large backyard. I know some people might have it, some people might not be really excited about it, but it's something that I really want. And if, I, if my additional work, aside from my day job, can help me get the finances in order for me to afford that dream, then I think it'll be worth it. I'm coaching lots of clients, I'm like, I have less free time because I do more work, but in the end, when I get that thing that I want, it's all gonna be worth it. Now then, it becomes a question of like, well, how do you know what you want? And that's what we're gonna, that, that's the final topic for this video. What you really want will evoke a emotional reaction out of you. So let's say your upbringing, you grew up very poor and money has always been kind of a tender subject for you because of your insecurities around you know, your household income level and such, then when, some, when you think about just like having a lot of money and that's sitting in your bank account and you don't have to worry about going paycheck to paycheck, it's gonna hit emotionally very different to people who are born in generational wealth. So like, yeah, to them, like a hundred thousand dollars is like, all right, it's like, I mean, I mean, that's part of my trust fund. But to someone who knows how difficult it is to live paycheck to paycheck, hundred thousand dollars is gonna be like, have a great emotional response. And like, just like me, one of the really big indicators of uh, emotional connection is to connect back with your childhood. What did you really like as a child? What experiences were really precious to you when you were a child? And when you get in touch with that side of you and you really observe what kind of things evoke an emotional reaction out of you, then you can know that is something that you uh, might be worth pursuing. So to summarize this video, if you are having trouble being motivated and you don't really see the reason to be motivated, number one, Assess if you are practicing unconditional self-love and do you really believe that you deserve the best for yourself? Do you really believe that you are worth all the things like money and gold can buy for you? If not, you want to figure out why you have those beliefs about yourself, why you think you're not worthy of that. Number two, if you have a lot of experiences um, being disappointed, accept that disappointment is just a price to pay for the thing that you really want and disappointment doesn't have to control your life and number three how to find out what you really want connect with your emotions and my personal tip is connect with your childhood experiences is this something that you want to work on with a professional but you don't think you can afford it well you could have seen a video like this but i coach clients on YouTube for free. I can put a face filter on you, I can modify your voice so that you can stay anonymous. So if you're interested in that, uh, read the descriptions below. Uh, I hope this video helps you find the motivation that you need in order to just do one action. Just one action that can change your life in one step. And in one year, you're gonna have 365 of those steps and you're, you'll be surprised. Doesn't even have to be your year just a month or two, you'll be surprised how far you went when you just adopt this mindset. Alright, with that said, I'll see you in the next video.